The third section of the Old Testament, this is the section called the Writings, which include, uh, in, inside it, three sections. We're going to talk about that. We discussed before that the Christian uh, layout of the Old Testament, what we know as the Old Testament, is usually broken up into four sections. And these sections reflect the, uh, the actual layout that we have in terms of from Genesis to Malachi in our Old Testament. We have the sections of law, which is true in everybody's consideration, Jewish, um, Christian, even Islamic. They look at the five books of Moses as, as the Hebrew law. That's uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, called the Torah in Hebrew, or law, or Pentateuch, or five books in Greek. The second section in the Christian version, our Old Testament, are the books of history, which go from Joshua to Esther. And again, that's the sequence that we have in our Bible. Third section is the wisdom books, they're called, the five books that go from Job through the Song of Songs, or the Song of Solomon. Some people have said, Song of Songs? Is there a book called Song of Songs? Well, that's the traditional name for it. It's the Song of Songs, or the Song of Songs of Solomon, or the Song of Solomon. Okay, But uh, that's the wisdom books. The fourth section in the Christian Old Testament is, are the books of prophecy from Isaiah through Malachi. Now, the Tanakh, which is the Hebrew Bible, which is exactly the same as our Old Testament in terms of content, is arranged differently, and they have different categories, and it's broken up differently. Whereas we have 39 books, they have 24. Not because they have any less content, but because they merge some of the books together. The 12 minor prophets, as we call them, are called the Book of the Twelve. Ezra and Nehemiah is one book. They don't break up Chronicles or Kings or Samuel. Those are all just one book, not first and second. All right? And in terms of the structure for the Old Testament uh, in the Hebrew Bible, or the, the Tanakh, they have three sections, not four. The first one is the same, the Law, the Torah, first five books of the Old Testament. Their section, their second section, is called the Book of the Prophets, which is called the Nevi'im. Torah is Law, Nevi'im are the Prophets. Um, they include Joshua, Judges, Samuel, what we call First and Second Samuel, Kings, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and the Book of the Twelve, which are all of the twelve minor prophets from Hosea to Malachi. The third section, which we're going to talk about in more detail today, is called the Ketuvim, which in, uh, in Hebrew means writings. The Ketuvim itself is broken up into three sections, and it's actually the Ketuvim, the writings, are sort of a catch-all. Anything that doesn't really fit clearly under the Law of the Prophets are included in this third section. The three sections of this are first what are called the Books of Truth, which are Psalms, Proverbs, and Job. They are the, uh, sometimes called the Poetic Books. The second section are called the Five Scrolls, um, and we're going to get into that quite a bit, the Megalot, the Hashim Megalot. The Five Scrolls are the Song of Songs, Ruth, Lamentation, Ecclesiastes, <coughs> and Esther. And then the last, which is really a catch-all, sometimes they're called the historical books, but they're not really historical books, per se, in terms of uh, Daniel is, a, is a, one of the most complicated books in the whole Bible in terms of what's in it. It's got apocalyptic, it's got prophetic, it's got poetic, it's got all historic, it's got all kinds of things. So, so in the other writings in the Ketuvim, we have Daniel, Ezra, Nehemiah, which again is one book in the Hebrew Bible, the Tanakh, and we have Chronicles, one and two. So those three sections of the writings make up Ketuvim, the third large section of the Hebrew Bible, or Tanakh. And you will recall, I'm giving you some review on this, and this is on the pages I just handed out. The word Tanakh, which is the word for the Hebrew Bible, is actually a, a, um, a taking of the three sections, Torah, Nevi'im, and Keduvim, abbreviating them, taking at least the first letter and then some vowels to hold them together, pushing those together, T N K. Torah, Nevi'im, uh, Ketuvim, and making the Tanakh. That's where the name comes from. All right. Any questions about that sort of... We've been over most of this before, but I wanted to make sure you understood where we were in terms of the analysis of the Hebrew Bible. And again, in this class, I've chosen to take the Hebrew uh, orientation because I think there is much for us to understand in that as opposed to the way that the Christian Bible is broken up. Because 
by breaking it up the way that, by us looking at it the way the Hebrews have broken up the Old Testament or the, the Tanakh, we have an understanding then of what they think is prophecy as opposed to what we think is prophecy. Because what they call the prophets, for instance, they don't include Daniel in that. Um, they, they have a very different understanding. They, they consider that Joshua is a prophetic book because it is a fulfillment of prophecy. So there, that's the reason that I've chosen to do it this way in terms of uh, being different than what most of the Christian approaches to it take. All right? Well, let's get started. The structure of the Ketuvim, the three poetic books, or the, the books of truth, Psalms, Proverbs, and Job. Then the Hamish Magalot, or the Five Scrolls, Song of Songs, Ruth, Lamentations, Ezekiel, and Esther. And then other writings, Daniel, Ezra, Nehemiah, and the Books of Chronicles. So let's look first at the poetic books. And you all remember, stop me if you have any questions as we go along in this. Um, the first of the poetic books is one of the favorite books that everybody has in the Bible, which are the Psalms. The word psalm actually means, in Hebrew, it's tehelim, which means the praises. It is a book that is 150 poems, or songs, that express prayer and worship in the Old Testament, uh, for the Old Testament Jewish people. Some of them are private, some of them are public, some of them reflect uh, what's supposed to be used in temple worship. We'll get into that. The focus, though, is prayer and worship. The question that they answer is, how do I approach God? How do I worship? How do I relate to God? And the Psalms is a beautiful expression of that. The second of the books of truth, or poetic books, is the book of Proverbs. Whereas Psalms is concerned with... Uh, the relationship with God, the spiritual matters in worship, the book of Proverbs take a, takes a very matter-of-fact kind of approach to wisdom and how you can gain wisdom for the purpose of living well. So whereas Psalms is focused on the life of the Spirit, the Proverbs really are focused on very practical kinds of godly living right now, and particularly related to the gaining of wisdom. And the question that it answers is, how should I live? How shall I live if I am a person of faith? And then we have the book of Job, which is likely, um, Job and Genesis are almost certainly the two oldest books in the Bible, where, you know, different scholars will say one or the other is older. The book of Job is about the problem of suffering, particularly the problem of suffering for a righteous person, someone who has not done anything wrong, and yet they experience suffering. And so the question that Job answers is, why do bad things happen to good people? It, Job has been one of the most influential pieces of literature in human history. And that's not just for the Jewish people, it's not just for Christian people. The book of Job, as an attempt to help people understand suffering, has been one of the most significant pieces of writing in human culture. And we're going to talk about that in a little bit more detail as we go along. I want to break these down now and go one at a time. I also should say that I don't think I'm going to get all the way through this. We sort of had an extra week seven next week. I had that I was going to focus on kind of the foundational books, but I wasn't real confident that was the right thing to do. As I de dealt with these books, I think next week I'm going to plan on focusing on um, the books that have to do with the Babylonian destruction and the uh, exile, which means Lamentations, which is which actually one of the, the five scrolls has to do with Jeremiah's lament over the destruction of Jerusalem by the Babylonians. But then you get Daniel, which Daniel's story is someone, one of the young men, uh, young princes of the Hebrews who is living in exile. Ezra and Nehemiah is then the return when they come back to Jerusalem, uh, when the, the Persians conquer Babylon and they allow the, the Jews to come back. So I think I'm going to focus on that exilic and post-exilic books next week simply because we've got too much to try to cover today. All right, let's talk about the Psalms, the hymn book of God. The book of Psalms, uh, there are a number of different kinds of Psalms that occur in this 150. And it's interesting that while we have 150 Psalms, there are some versions of the Psalm book that have 151. For instance, the Psalms that are found in um, the Dead Sea Scrolls, there's 151st Psalm. The, the, the couple of other sort of sects have recognized that. The 151st Psalm was not acknowledged as being part of canon. There's nothing inherently wrong with it. It's not like it says, you know, 
God is a three-headed toad or anything like that. It's, a, it's just it wasn't accepted as part of our canon, and so we don't have 150 first. But there, we see 150 psalms. The first and most common kind are praise psalms. They are psalms that are in praise to God for His grace and for His, his uh, power. The second kind are songs of thanksgiving, simply giving thanks to God for all that He has done. The third kind are royal psalms. They have to do with acknowledgement of uh, the coronation of the king, of the king as a representative of God's power, of the recognition. Uh, some of these are, are uh, even messianic. Um, we then have wisdom psalms, psalms that have to do uh, a tone similar to what you get in Proverbs with how we are supposed to live a wise life. The next are psalms of remembrance, uh, recalling when it was in the past that God is particularly blessed. Then we have psalms of lament. They are psalms of grieving, of some um, wrong that has happened either to the individual or to the nation of Israel. And then we have imprecatory or judgment psalms. They really are curses against um, the people who have violated the will of God, who have done evil to the, to the psalm writer. And some of them are pretty harsh. In, in fact, I was gone. Um, this is two years ago. I was gone on vacation, and somebody else selected the readings for, and they included a psalm. I was told this later. A psalm, the end of which was, and may we bash the heads of their babies against the rocks. And I'm told that when the person read that, somebody in the congregation went, oh my, you know, because that's not the general tone of the psalms, but there are, there are a few of them that are quite harsh in terms of cursing against those who have, who have violated God, who have... Um, done ill to God's people and representative. Okay? Um, the majority of the Psalms are credited to David as the author. In fact, um, 73 of the Psalms, very specifically of the 150, are said to have been authored by, by King David, who was, of course, a poet, a musician. The Psalms are poems. Many of them, however, are meant to be sung. And there are, I'm going to show you a little bit later, there are specific musical notations that come with some of them. Unfortunately, there are a lot, of, a lot of those kinds of comments or notations that we no longer know what they mean. For instance, the word selah, which you've probably seen in Psalms, S-E-L-A-H, which comes at the end, or sometimes even in the middle of some of the Psalms, we believe was a musical instruction, but we don't know what it means. Nobody knows what it means anymore. There are other song, uh, psalms that say to be sung to the tune of, and they give us the name of a song. We don't know what that tune is anymore. Okay, you know it's like singing to the tune of Amazing Grace, but we don't we don't have Amazing Grace around anymore. We don't know what it's like. It's similar to that. So David is the 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 most prolific writer of the psalms. We also have Asaph, which is one of uh, David's court musicians, is credited with writing twelve of the of the uh, psalms. Ten of the psalms are credited to the sons of Korah, two are said to be written by Solomon, and then one each by Moses, Heman, and Ethan. How many were Korah? Okay, we Korah was, uh, to, and I'll, I'll, I'll give you some. Yeah, yeah. The, the sons of Korah, ten. So ten were written by the sons of Korah, two by Solomon, one each by Moses, Heman, which looks like He-Man, except you don't even uh, capitalize the N, and Ethan. Right? So we have, but by far, David is the most prolific of those writers. This gives you a little bit of the structure. The book of Psalms is broken up into five books or sections. They are the first section, uh, chapters 1 to 41, uh, or book 1, I'm sorry, 1 to 41, and then the book 2, 42 to 72. Those were mostly written by David. That's a generality. We do have credits in them but most of those by David. Book 3 was written mostly by Asaph, which I mentioned to you. Uh, book 4, mostly anonymous. They're, they're the ones that are least credited. And then uh, chapters 107 to 150 form book 5, again, mostly by David. And I want to go through those just a little bit uh, as we talk about them. The, the book 1 are the introductory um, psalms. Psalm 1 and 2 were not written by David, but then David sort of picks up. In the second book, the title Elohim is used much more often than the, than the proper name of God, Yahweh. Now, the, that has led liberal scholars to draw all sorts of conclusions, which I think are necessary and uncalled for. 
Um, we ran into that a little bit because in the, uh, the theology book that we have on Wednesdays, um, and he takes a fairly liberal scholarly approach to, to the Old Testament, he talks about the Elohistic uh, Psalter. Psalter is the name for a psalm book, right? That's what a Psalter is. is. Well, he talks about the Elohistic Psalter as being the psalms that are in this book too. The reason being that Elohim, which is, the, is a, a more generic word for God, it's not the proper name Yahweh, but it's a more generic word for God or Lord, is used rather than the proper name Yahweh. Uh, liberal scholars say, well, somebody else wrote that. In fact, they wrote it at a completely different time period in a completely different location and they got added later. Um, that is not the evangelical belief. The belief is that there are times when, in the same way that I use words that are synonymous uh, with each other at different times for different purposes, that there were times in which the psalm writers, be it David or one of the others, would have used a different name for God. Sometimes I say God, sometimes I say Lord, you know, sometimes I say Father. We believe that's very similar. But it is a characteristic of this second book that uh, there are, there's more often the use of the name Elohim. Then, um, since the first two books represent David's Psalms mostly, as well as the book five, we see, for instance, in book, uh, Psalm 52 to 59, which are all part of the second book, a number of psalms which David wrote during his flight from Saul. You will remember the story. King Saul was the first king of Israel. He violated God's will. I mean, he had several shaky instances, and then finally he ended up offering sacrifices, which is something he'd been very specifically told he was not supposed to do, because that was the, that was the job of uh, Samuel, who was priest and prophet of God. And for that reason, God decided to take the kingship away from him and had Samuel go and anoint this young, young man, or a young boy practically, David, who later would become king. Well, along the way, Saul gets more and more neurotic and more and more angry, and he ends up taking it out on David, and David has to run for his life. And so during this time, uh, David writes psalms. Some of them are psalms of lament because he's been treated unjustly. Some of them are psalms of praise because God has taken care of him. Um, song, uh, psalms of Remembrance, but here we have between 52 and 59 specifically the Psalms about when he was running from Saul for his life. Now, I mentioned here, a I, I said there were words that we don't really know fully the meaning of anymore. Two of those, which you will see, are the words maskel and michtan. These are ancient Hebrew words. As best we can tell, based upon what we think of the roots of those words, a maskel of David means a meditation a thoughtful kind of uh, um, meditating or ruminating on events. The other word, michtam, we believe has the root in the same word that uh, in he ancient Hebrew is golden or gold, that it was a golden prayer because most of those take much more of a prayer, they're much more of a direct address to God than a recollection of some events that's happened. But that's an example of the fact that um, even in the Psalms of David, we do not understand all of the words that are involved in those. But David is the, the predominant writer of the first two books, if you will, the first two sections of the five sections of the book of Psalms. Then when we get to book three, which were written mostly by Asaph, the focus is not so much on personal experience with God or running from Saul or any of those kinds of things, or even direct personal praise. It's much more an acknowledgement of God's presence in, in the nation of Israel, the people of Israel, in Jerusalem and the temple. Um, the Psalms were written during the time period of David and Solomon and after. One of them was written by Moses, which is quite a bit before that. But you get this range of time. So the third book were written when the temple had been established because it's, uh, the temple is a major theme in that, along with the, the nation of Israel itself and the city of Jerusalem as being the holy city. Now you will remember, I'm sure, that Jerusalem had not always been a city that was part of Israel. The Jebusites who controlled Jerusalem held out against the initial conquering of the land of Canaan by Joshua and the armies of Israel. And it wasn't until David became king that David conquered the city of Jerusalem, which was controlled by the Jebusites, and when he conquered it, it was such a victory, because here's a city, that, a fortified city that had held out against all the other efforts by the Israelites prior to that, 
um, that he declared that this was his special city now. It became the city of David. And in it, he determined that he would have his headquarters, and because it's right in the middle of the country, or what was then the country, that that would be the center of both his monarchy and it would also be the center for their worship, and that that's where the temple would be built. Of course, David didn't build the temple. He prepared for it and wanted to, but God said, no, this is not for you to do. This is for your son to do, and I will bring your son. He will sit on the throne through his whole life because you have been honored. You have honored me, David, and he will build your temple. So Solomon actually had it pretty easy because David, his father, gathered all the gold and all the jewels and all the silver and all the wood and all the bricks and stone and everything that was needed and got everybody else to contribute to it. And so all this stuff was stacked up. And when David died and Solomon became king, he started immediately with the construction of the temple because all the preparatory work had been done by his father. And so it was only four years later that the temple of the Lord was built. But the third book of the Psalms focuses primarily on both the nation of Israel, the city of Jerusalem, which was not a city in Israel until David conquered it, and the temple, which Solomon built. Okay. The fourth book switches over and does not use the word Elohim as uh, in reference to God very often. It's in there, but it's not very often. It more often uses Yahweh, which was the proper name of God, the Tetragrammaton, it's called. Um, and so you get a much more personal kind of sense. These psalms are mostly anonymous. They are not credited. We're not sure who's responsible for them. Um, and then we get to the fifth book, mostly by David, which are the sort of grand celebration, the summing up of, of all of the rest. Um, and it includes, for instance, like in Psalm 127, it's, it's a charge to his son Solomon. It's a preparation for the con continuation of the royal monarchy into the future for the sake of uh, being honoring to God. I want to go back a little bit and look at a couple of things. Psalm 1 is a good example. I want to give you a couple of uh, examples of the ways in which the Psalms are uh, poetic in terms of parallelism. Hebrew is a language that is full of uh, the double meaning of words, of the use of parallelism, of the use of rhythm and rhyme. Uh, you get that very obviously, the 119th Psalm, the longest of all the Psalms. It has one chapter for each character in the Hebrew alphabet. And if you go on your Bible and look, you'll see the Hebrew characters at the top of the sections that are in Psalm 119. The Hebrews really did a lot with, with structure and parallelism and rhythm and that sort of thing. You remember when we talked about the Hebrew language and the Masoretic text and all that, the Hebrews had special cantillation, which means pronunciations. Um, when you read the Hebrew publicly, which much of the Psalms were intended to be either read or sung publicly, there were very prescribed ways as to how you do that because of the rhythms that were involved. Now, the first Psalm, for instance, you see there's a parallelism. Blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the path of the sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scoffers. This sort of parallelism, walking, standing, sitting, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. If, you, if you're aware of it, uh, alert to it, as you go through the Psalms, you will often see those kinds of parallels occurring, which were even much more meaningful even if you read it in Hebrew, because frequently those, the words will not only represent a physical action like these do, but frequently they will rhyme, or they will be based on the same root. You know, there will be very clear parallelisms and connections between um, another example would be Psalm 22 to 24. We have the stories of the suffering servant, the good shepherd, the sovereign king. So three of these in a row represents a, a personage, if you will, of, a very, of various kinds. They were written together, and so the idea of taking suffering servant, good shepherd, sovereign king, all of which are representative of an image that, that the writer had of God. Um, Likewise, if you get to, uh, for instance, Psalm 42, and we believe Psalm 42 and 43 originally probably were one psalm because the structure continues from one end to the other. Uh, you get echoing of words like, Hope in God, for I shall again praise Him for the help of His presence. Hope in God, for I shall yet praise Him, the help of my countenance and my God. Hope in God, for I shall again praise Him, the help of my countenance and my God. You'll see this repetition of things. You also get some things that sound kind of strange to our ear sometimes, not only in Psalms, but elsewhere in Hebrew writings. It will say things like, there are six things that God hates, seven which he cannot stand. Right? 
this is poetry. This is just a way of saying that there are some things that God will not put up with, and this is how they emphasize it. You know, there are four things I despise, five things which are, uh, are beyond me. And you get those kinds of expressions, which are all expressions of the, the way the Hebrews handled language. They were very poetic people. One of the reasons, and one of the reasons why the Psalms is a book of worship, but it's a book that, uh, that deals in poetry and poetic images and song, is because the Hebrew people recognized that Yahweh God was beyond their ability to really explain in, in prose. There's a point at which our language breaks down and we can't accurately describe God. And so to deal with that, especially in their worship songs and poems, the Hebrews used this beautiful poetic imagery. You know, they would use the imagery of the mountains and the, and the clouds and the sky and the sea and all of these other things in order to try to get some scale, poetic scale, for what, what their God was like. And you find that a lot in Psalms. And that's the reason we find the Psalms so beautiful, without really realizing it, I think, is that... That's the way the Hebrew language worked. This is an example of where in the Psalms we have instructions that we don't know what they mean. Uh, Psalm 45 says, this is for the choir director. I don't think Carolyn's here, is she? Uh, this is for the choir director according to Shoshanim, which we believe would have been another song or a, a kind of song. A mascal of the sons of Korah, you remember earlier I said a mascal we believe is a kind of meditation, but we don't know for sure, a song of love. And then it goes on with the actual psalm, my heart overflows with a good theme, I address my verses to the king, my tongue is the pen of a steady writer, etc. But we have sort of introductory notes, stage directions if you will, um, for, for these psalms, and some of them, a few of them we know, but most of them we have no clue what that really refers to, because that's been lost in antiquity. And people say, well, how do you lose something like that? Well, you need to remember that there were at least two times in the history of the Jewish people where the center of their whole civilization was destroyed. I mean, first, you had the destruction of the first temple um, by the Babylonians, so that, and everything that was in the temple was destroyed. Jerusalem was leveled, remember? That's why Ezra and Nehemiah had to go back and rebuild it. And so, it's like their, their equivalent of the Library of Congress was in there, and it's gone. And then later on, as they tried to rebuild the whole culture, they get 600 years later to A.D. 70, and the Romans do it again. They destroy Jerusalem, they burn the temple, any records that they had. That's why we don't have very old uh, copies of the ancient Hebrew text, and why some of ancient Hebrew, which was a dead language before the 1940s, when the Jewish people of, uh, who returned to Israel <coughs> revivified, I mean, they, they brought it back from being a dead language, um, that's why we still don't know how to pronounce some ancient Hebrew words, because all of the records were destroyed twice. The oldest Hebrew texts that we have that are biblical texts are the Dead Sea Scrolls, and the oldest of those are from the second century, or the, uh, actually about 200, 250, third century. Um, BC. That's the oldest that we have. Becky? What was the first group that destroyed the records? Uh, the Babylonians. The Babylonians in second was Romans. In the Romans, yeah. 586 was the first destruction of Jerusalem by Babylon. Um, and we'll get into that when we, probably next week, when we get into Ezra, Nehemiah, Lamentations, and Daniel, which are the, the, the Babylonian destruction, the Babylonian exile, and then the return from the Babylonian exile. And then, even more completely, uh, the Romans did a really thorough job of destroying uh, the city of Jerusalem and the temple, which is why today, if you've ever been to Jerusalem, the only part of the ancient temple that still survives is the Western Wall, the Wailing Wall, um, because the Romans destroyed everything and burned it. Um, so, <laughs> another example that we don't know exactly what it means, for, for the choir director, set to al Tashhed. Now again, we think that that was either a musical notation or it was a song. Um, a, a michtam, which we believe is a golden uh, prayer, of David when he fled from Saul in the cave. But we don't know what part of that means. Wouldn't it be wonderful if someday they find another bunch of Dead Sea Scrolls or the equivalent, which helps us understand that. Because there were things that God explained when they found the Dead Sea Scrolls. And if, if some of you weren't in class, I don't think when we dealt with that in the... the 1940s, 
a shepherd in the Qumran area of the Dead Sea, where it's very, very, very dry, um, actually was chasing a goat, tossed a rock at it, and went inside one of these caves that are in the cliff sides there, and he heard breaking pottery. He went in to find out what was going on, and they found these large jars, which, were, which contained papyrus scrolls. Papyrus is very fragile, and if it gets damp, it molds. It's, it's organic. It's made from a reed, a plant. And so very few of the ancient papyrus stuff had survived. But Qumran is very, very dry. It's at the Dead Sea, one of the lowest parts of the planet. The Dead Sea itself is the lowest part of the planet. There's no humidity there. These things were in, in ceramic vessels, or clay vessels, rather. Not ceramic. And they were in these dry caves. Well, they started looking, and they looked for a number of years. And they, uh, after this initial big find, they, uh, they found others as well. Well, the Dead Sea Scrolls are the oldest extant biblical documents we have, including the entire scroll of the book of Isaiah, for instance. Um, everything, I think the book of, um, I don't think the book of Esther, I think we don't have any es Esther in the Dead Sea Scrolls, but at least part portions of every other Old Testament book. So very, very significant, but that's the oldest we have, and they range from, from the 200s BC to the first century AD. Was, was the book of I believe the Book of Enoch was, and so it's not all just, <clears throat> in fact, it wasn't all just the uh, books of the Tanakh, of the Old uh, Hebrew Old Testament. They found some uh, apocryphal or pseudepigraphal writings. They found some records from this um, Essene community, which was the community that had collected this stuff, and a few <coughs> other things as well. So and some, of, some of the writings they had, the Essene community um, had collected them. They're not part of what the Hebrew canon is now. Petey? What is in the Dead Sea Scrolls that would destroy a man's faith? Um, I don't think it... Well, I'm not sure I understand the question. What, what is in the Dead Sea Scrolls? Right, I understand what you said, but what do you mean by would destroy a man's faith? He had been educated in all Catholic schools in India. He had a very firm faith and he has none now. Who's that? Who is that? Yes. Who is that? Yeah. A business partner of ours. Okay, I didn't know who you were talking about. I, I thought maybe it was a historical character or something. No. Okay. Um, I, there shouldn't be anything, not if somebody has real faith anyway. In fact, quite the contrary, one of the things the Dead Sea Scrolls did was um, liberal scholars had said, well, the changes that have occurred through the, the scribal process, through copying the Old Testament, because we didn't have very ancient copies, the, the process of copying them, they added things, they took things out, people, people turned them into what they wanted them to be, etc., etc., etc. And so liberal scholars had said, you can't really rely on the Old Testament as being accurately the Word of God because it's been changed so much. Well, when they found the Dead Sea Scrolls, what they discovered were that, uh, was that there are minor scribal errors, like somebody would um, repeat a word somewhere but nothing of any theological significance was found. No variances. In fact, liberal scholars had to go back and completely rethink their, uh, their ideas about this because they could no longer just sort of brush it off and say, well, if we had the original documents, if we had older documents, they would show that this isn't really what, what the original looked like. Well, we, have, we ended up with five centuries older than anything we had previously, and it's, it's almost exactly what we have. And so now, scholars are saying, apparently, while there may have been minor mistakes, there are no mistakes of any theological significance. So why somebody would, would look at the Dead Sea Scrolls or learn about the Dead Sea Scrolls and lose their faith, uh, my assumption would be that's just an excuse and there was something else going on. Because I, I, don't, I don't think the Dead Sea Scrolls do anything that would really you know, compromise our faith. Quite the contrary. Becky? Um, do they need the Essie? Well, they, yes, they believe they were a product of the Essene community, which was a sect of Judaism. Um, they were a, a sort of separatist sect. You know, they, they believed in being by themselves. They had an imminent expectation of um, the return of God and the Messiah, which would be a cataclysmic time. They were sort of apocalyptic in their view. They followed what they called the teacher of righteousness, who was sort of like their local prophet or local, you know, their local religious leader. Um, so we know some, not an enormous amount, uh, but we do know some about the Essene community and uh, what they were about. They were Jewish, but they were a particular sect of Judaism at that time. Okay. They were found what year? 
19, starting in the 1940s, I think 1947 was the first finding, and they continue to find stuff, some stuff up until the 1950s. So, would they have yes. put them in there to preserve for future people, or why would they put them in a cave? Well, again, uh, as an ap apocalyptic community, and they were around when, when the Romans came through and were cleaning the Jews out, all right? And the Romans treated the Essenes like one more community of Jews that they felt like they had to suppress. And because the Essenes saw themselves as a specially elect group, you know, they were, they were an apocalyptic community and thought that they had it more right than the rest of the Jews, then they put all of their sacred documents, not all of which were considered sacred documents to the rest of Judaism, like Enoch and some of the others, they put them in these jars and hid them in these caves in order to protect them when they knew that the Romans were coming and they were burning everything and destroying everything. So, uh, it was an effort to try to preserve them. Okay? All right. Um, there are several sections of the Psalms which had specific uses over time. Um, one of them, one of those sections is called the Hallel. Hallel means the praise. It's where we get our word hallelujah. Um, the Psalms of Praise, the entire Hallel is Psalm 113 to 118. There's a shorter section within that they call the Great Hallel. Um, these were sections of the Psalms which were read at special feasts at Passover, at the Festival of Weeks or Tabernacles, uh, um, or the Festival of Weeks and the Festival of Tabernacles. And they were public readings. They would do this in public. Uh, and I'm getting, when we get to the book of uh, the Five Scrolls, the Hashem Megalod, all five of those are still today used as part of specific special celebrations. But an example of the Psalms of Praise in the Hallel, uh, Psalm 118, Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. His love endures forever. Let Israel say, His love endures forever. Now this may have been done originally as a responsive reading. And you can sort of hear it in this, right? Yeah. Let, uh, let Israel say, His love endures forever. Let the house of Aaron say, His love endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord say, His love endures forever. These were intended for public reading. They, and they were used at the major festivals um, in, in reading. And I, in fact, let me show you uh, I have a picture. This, you see the arrow right there. This is the structure of the temple, uh, the second temple. And it was designed so that you had the steps leading up to the entrance. This was where the Holy of Holies was back in here. This was the, the uh, main courtyard, and then the courtyard of the Gentiles and the women were outside. But it was designed so that if you went up the steps and stood right here, it was a sort of a commanding kind of presence, and that's where the readers or cantors would do the public reading in the festivals so that everybody who was here, and probably even out in the courtyards, could hear them. Because every major festival of, of the Jewish faith, there were things to be read in public. There were celebrations out of, especially the Psalms, but other parts of Scripture as well. Okay, let me go back here. Another part of the uh, Psalm 118 from the Hallel, I will give you thanks for you answered me, you have become my salvation. Now you might, remember, you might recognize this. The stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. The Lord has done this and it is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. So this was part of the great public celebratory reading of the Psalms. And this Hallel, these, uh, these particular chapters, 113 to 118, were used probably more than any other uh, for these kind of public readings. Okay. Now, what's the value of the Psalms to us, besides just being beautiful? Um, First, I think we need to see the Psalms as a commentary in the whole rest of the Old Testament because some of them are Psalms of remembrance, looking back to what God has done. Some are recognitions of God's greatness as Lord. Some are recognition of what God has done politically in terms of the king. So we really do find kind of a, a, um, a, a song book or psalm book commentary on a lot of the other things that are happening in Scripture. And it's useful to get that reflection. Um, how did everything else that had happened to the Hebrew people get reflected and uh, expressed in their worship? That's what the Psalms are. Okay? We then see it as liturgy. We learn about the Jewish worship because of that. Uh, we understand more about how they were uh, involved in their own worship. 
Some of the psalms we see very clearly as a pattern for living. Some of them are called wisdom psalms because they have particular instructions for us. But even more than just the practical part, the wisdom for living, I think, would include a better understanding for us of who God is and how we're supposed to relate to him. Um, and then wisdom for living, uh, pattern for prayer. Not, this was not just for the Hebrews, they're for us today. This is the reason why every week in when we do our responsive reading, the responsive reading is always taken from the Psalms. There's a, a short section each year where we'll do them from Proverbs, but most of the responsive reading we have is from the Psalms. Because we need to hear this great worshipful liturgy that was given to, uh, to the Jewish people through various writers, especially David, as a way of celebrating and uh, worship of God. Any questions about Psalms? Are any of the songs songs that we sing today? Yeah, we, we have, uh, particularly there are praise songs that have been written on that. Um, there are some hymns that take passages from them, but there are also are praise songs that have been that take directly, and uh, none of them are jumping into my mind. Who can think of one? This will be on the test. No. This is the day. This is the day that the Lord has made. We just read that. Okay. Right. The Lord's my shepherd. I will not want. You know. Um, so those are obvious ones, but there are a lot of other songs that we've taken from that. It would be great if we knew what the original music sounded like. Would that would that be fun? All right. Let's talk about the second of the books of truth, or the poetry books, and that is uh, the book of Proverbs, or the book of wisdom. The theme of wisdom is entirely the focus of this book. Wisdom in terms of how do you live your life as a person who wishes to be a servant of God, a person of faith. Um, this is how it starts. The book of Proverbs starts out telling you exactly what it's about. Proverbs it says the Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel. And so, again, liberal scholars question everything, but there's no question in our mind that Solomon is the author of this um, for attaining wisdom and discipline, for understanding words of insight, for acquiring a disciplined and prudent life, doing what is right and just and fair, for giving prudence to the simple, knowledge and discretion to the young, let the wise listen and add to their learning, and let the discerning get guidance, for understanding proverbs and parables, the sayings and riddles of the wise. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and discipline. Tells you right up front what this book is for. And as you go through Proverbs, most, it's mostly full of aphorisms, which means one-liners, that, um, that are beautiful in their insight about what it's like to uh, live a good life, to, to gain wisdom, to apply wisdom to your life, to live the kind of life that God would desire for us to live. Um, the basic outline of Proverbs is this. It starts with a prologue, which I have just given you, and then the appeal to wisdom, which is also included in what I just gave you, that first seven verses. The six is the prologue of the purpose. The seven is the appeal to wisdom, and wisdom is personified throughout this. Wisdom is called she. And it's interesting that that, that kind of idea was carried through in a lot of ancient cultures. The Greeks, for instance, the Greek word for wisdom is Sophia, you know, a woman's name. And so, and the, the great church that I've mentioned several times that was in Istanbul, um, the grand church that was built in the 500s was the Hagia Sophia, right? Of the place of wisdom, because it was a place given uh, to the wisdom of God, to saintly wisdom. So wisdom is personified throughout this. You get from chapter 10 to chapter 30 these one-verse maxims, aphorisms as I call them, the sort of one-liners that are brilliant and beautiful. And sometimes as you go through, you will see them being echoed back. Uh, you, will, you will get a verse and you'll go a little ways and you'll get it again and you'll go a little ways and you'll get it again. Well, if you, if you spoke Hebrew well and if you bothered to really look at it, frequently those things are structured. Um, I'm going to give you an example of that next week in the book of Daniel about how things are very specifically structured in a lot of the Old, of the, uh, Old Testament books. The book of Daniel, for instance, starts out with a declaration, and then it builds, and, and Daniel is half written in Aramaic, which was the, the language of the Babylonians, Chaldean, it's also called. Um, it's structured to a, to a high point, and then sort of comes back, and then it switches to Hebrew, and it does exactly the same kind of structure, and comes back again. Uh, there's a lot of structure in these things, and the one-verse maxims frequently are repeated in different ways. 
You have the Proverbs of Solomon in here and also the Proverbs of Hezekiah. Hezekiah was one of the good kings of the southern kingdom of uh, Judah. Hezekiah did a lot to try to bring reforms. When he died, his, uh, and Hezekiah is the one that held out against the Assyrian king um, when Sennacherib showed up and wanted to conquer uh, Jerusalem and the southern kingdom of Judah the way he had, he had conquered, or his, his father had conquered the northern kingdom of Israel. Um, Hezekiah refused to open the gates of Jerusalem to him because uh, Isaiah the prophet said, no, God is going to save us. God is going to preserve us. Well, Sennacherib's army apparently contracted the plague by God's good design and ended up, he turned around and went home uh, and was later assassinated by his sons. But, uh, so Hezekiah was a good king. Unfortunately, when he died, his son Manasseh came along. Manasseh was a horrible king. He reinstituted all of the pagan worship. He put a pole of Asherah um, worship in the temple. And it wasn't until Manasseh died that his son Josiah, who was very young when he became king, as he grew up, he turned around and was one of the best kings that Judah ever had. He did even more than his grandfather Hezekiah had done to rectify all of the false worship and all those kinds of things. So you get the Proverbs of Hezekiah here. Then you get into couplets, larger couplets. The couplets obviously are, you know, like A, B, A, B kind of stuff. Some of them are longer. But again, you see structure in that because this is poetry. The words of Agur, who is one of the writers here. And then the beautiful passage in Proverbs 31, which we read very recently as one of our Old Testament readings about the righteous woman or the good woman, a woman who cares for her family and for her husband, who makes a good living and worships the Lord, you know, this... this Proverbs 31 um, is something that you guys don't want to bring up too often to your spouses if you're married, because um, make you look bad. These are believed to have been the words of King Lemuel. Um, so that's the basic structure. Questions about any of that? Who is Agur, and where was the king of Lemuel? Was he uh, was he like in in Israel? Was it or was he a king of Judah, or is he a Kind of like a, just maybe a literary figure? Or we know very little. Um, we do know that Agur is identified as the son of Jehi. Uh, beyond that, I don't think we have any real details. Frequently, and, and that's quite consistent in Hebrew writing, by the way. The, the reason why we have some books that are not identified, the author's not identified, is because for Hebrew writers, and some of this carries over even to the New Testament, uh, Paul was not like this, but like the writer of Hebrews, we don't know who wrote it. It doesn't identify. It was considered um, that when you wrote something in the Hebrew mindset, that it belonged to the public, and that it was inappropriate for you to claim that it was that you wrote it. And so most books don't say, you know, like Paul, Paul would say, Paul, an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the servants at you know in Corinth or whatever. He would be very specific. Most Hebrew writers wouldn't do that was considered inappropriate to claim authorship, especially if you're writing something that you thought was given by God. And so we have example, we have names sometimes dropped in, but there's no, even if we have a name, there's no more biological information on some of these people. We don't know a lot about who the sons of Kohath were. We know they were of the Levitical tribe. We, we don't, there, there are a lot of these folks that we simply don't have details about. Them. Because that was characteristic of the style, you know, and of the culture at that time. Okay. Other questions? Uh, what something you mentioned was Daniel also included in the Dead Sea Scrolls? Uh, yes, part of Daniel was in the Dead Sea Scrolls, not the whole book. In fact, as I say, I think part of every book except Esther, if I'm remembering correctly, but almost every book um, of the Dead Sea Scrolls, there was at least a portion of those books in that. And so that's why it was considered such a, I mean, if they just found the scroll of Isaiah, the whole of Isaiah, which is the one book we have all of in the Sentence of Scrolls, that would have been unbelievable. But the fact that they got at least part of, of every, almost every book in the Hebrew Bible was amazing. And so they could make direct comparisons, okay, this is the best, the best that we have now, you know, what we believe is the best copy. And when they compared them, they went, wow, there's virtually no difference. Yes, fine. Uh, I'm just a little confused as to what they had then was copies up to then, and these were copies as well. But they had the the scripture, they had the Pentateuch, and they had the all, all right. of that. They had that in position, but they had lost copies. Or well, 
um, <clears throat> partly because the material they were printing on, I mean, they didn't have hard drives that they could save the stuff on permanently or whatever, um, photocopies, you know, photographic. So the only way when, when you had a, a papyrus scroll, which is very fragile, and if, it, if it's humid, it starts decaying or whatever, when that started wearing out or going bad, the only thing they could do was copy it to a new papyrus. And then when that one started going bad, they copy it to a new one. The question always among, in scholarship is, what's the oldest one you have? Because the closer a copy is to the original, the more likely it is to be uh, accurate. accurate. Because there have been fewer opportunities for people to add mistakes, right? And so the issue was the oldest versions that we had were um, like we have a Gospel of Mark for an, I'm talking this New Testament. We have a Gospel of Mark that goes back to the to the fifth century. Well, that's the oldest of the New Testament documents that we have, uh, and it's only a portion. If you ever go to the Isle of Patmos, they have like a sixth century Mark there in their in their museum. But for the Hebrew documents, the oldest documents we had were not actually in Hebrew. They were in Greek because in the second century. The, the Jewish scholars had copied the Hebrew, and this is before the destruction, the second destruction of the temple, which they, when they still had a lot of, of very old documents, or the oldest documents available, they translated it from Hebrew into Greek because a lot of the Jewish people didn't speak Hebrew anymore, and they needed to be able to read the Bible. So that would have been second century BC. Then when the temple was destroyed, because that was in Greek, they kept those, and they had copies, older copies of that, like in Alexandria and in other places. The oldest Hebrew copies were in Jerusalem, got destroyed in 70 AD, and so the very oldest documents that we had of the Hebrew Bible were not in Hebrew. They were in Greek. Then we find the Dead Sea Scrolls, which are in Hebrew, and they go back, some of them further back, than the Greek Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Hebrew. So the issue is, what's the oldest version we have? Because the older it is, the more likely it is it's going to be accurate. Fair? Okay, let me give you sort of, I mentioned earlier the, uh, a little bit the difference between Psalms and Proverbs. Let me, let me bring that up. Because the two of these books, Psalms and Proverbs, and they often get mentioned together because they're similar in some ways, uh, but they really do reflect two different parts of human expression uh, for a person of faith. The book of Psalms is a book of worship. The book of Proverbs is a book of wisdom about how to live life. The book of Psalms speaks to our spirit. Proverbs speaks to our intellect. That's why wisdom is something that is, is, it is the focus of Proverbs. Psalms is about life of prayer. Proverbs is about life out on the street. A lot of Proverbs has to do with don't fall in with prostitutes. Very practical stuff. Here's how bad it will be for you if you start messing around with, you know, women of the night. Um, Psalms teaches us how to be holy before God. Proverbs teaches us how to practice holiness before men. Don't do this stuff if you want to stay holy. Okay. Uh, Psalms has to do with loving the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Proverbs has to do with loving your neighbor as yourself. We're, I'm inserting there a little bit, but it's, uh, it's a good balance. Because Psalms is all about our relationship with God. Proverbs is how do you live life, and much of that has to do with how you relate to your Fellow, fellow person, okay? And so those two together, very appropriately, really do give a much more three-dimensional kind of explanation for what it is to be a person of faith before God and living in this world, okay? Some of the major themes in Proverbs include the way of wisdom. Wisdom, as I said, is personified in Proverbs. It talks about principles of work. You'll get examples like this one here. Go to the ant, O sluggard. Sluggard is a lazy person. Observe her ways and be wise, which having no chief officer or ruler prepares her food in the summer and gathers her provisions in the harvest. It has to do with you got to work if you're going to eat. Pretty practical stuff. Um, it gets into... Um, what's that? It used to be true. Principles of business and finance, taking care of money, not spending money you don't have. Principles of spiritual speech, things like Proverbs 26, for lack of wood, the fire goes out, and where there is no whisperer, contention quiets down. These proverbs, I mean, the word proverb has come to mean, for us, a wise saying, right? 
um, with lack of wood, the fire goes out. If you don't, if, if you, um, if there's a problem with gossip, the best way to stop gossip is what? Shut up! Don't talk about it. Okay? Because you're adding fuel to the fire when you do that. Um, the universal need for wisdom, the universal arena of wisdom, which is in our practical um, application in our life. What is wise is also what is good is a major theme or lesson from Proverbs. It deals with principles rather than promises. So much of the Hebrew understanding of the relationship with God had to do with promises, with what God had promised to them. Well, this is very practical. These are principles. This is how you need to live. You've got to take responsibility for yourself, in other words. Yes, God has made promises. God will bless you. God will be there for you. But you have responsibility to live up to. There are things you don't do, like hang around with prostitutes. There are things you do do, like work for a living and, earn and, and don't spend money you don't have. Very practical kind of stuff. And it is a real view of the real world. The book of Proverbs, is, it, while it's poetic and you're reading these couplets and everything, these, if you sort of sit back and take them one at a time and think about it, boy, this hits you right between the eyes. This is very practical stuff about how to live in the world. And yet beautiful too. Becky. So are you saying we need the Bible in schools? Is that what you're saying? What's that? <laughs> we need the Bible in schools? Well, what kind of help? We, need, we need the Bible in homes exactly. first. Yeah. We need parents to be using it. Exactly. I, and let me comment on that. I do, not, I do not believe in prayer in schools, public schools. I don't believe in, and you know why I don't? Because who decides who you're praying to? If you've got a Muslim principal or a Buddhist guidance counselor, which they have a perfect right to be that, who decides who you're praying to? And when we say we want, you know, we want religion in the schools, in a pluralistic society, you're maybe creating more problems for yourself than you realize. I think the thing that we ought to do is recognize that the responsibility for that being part of a child's life is at home. Where the parents who are believing, you know, followers of Jesus, make sure that that's foundational to who they are and how they live and what they believe, so that it doesn't matter what they're hearing or not hearing at school. All right? I think there have been too many generations of parents who thought that they were going to leave it to the schools to teach their kids what was right or wrong, and that's that idea. <laughs> it's the least I can say about that. So I am not an advocate of religion in public schools because that means somebody else is teaching your kids religion. And you don't know what religion they're teaching them. It could be anything. And in a pluralistic, in a, we could say, well, it should be Christianity. Well, you know what? We're a plural, pluralistic society. And Muslims pay taxes too. And Buddhists pay taxes too. We don't really have a right to say that. So I'm not an advocate of, of the expression of religion in public schools. Some of you, I'm sure, really disagree with that. But I think that that's it's not the way to go. OK, we're going to take a break. Anybody wants to beat me up, I'll be here. Um, we now want to talk about the third book in the books of truth, or the poetic books, which is the book of Job. You may not have thought of the book of Job as being a poetic book, but in fact the majority of it is written in, in poetic form rather than prose. It actually starts with prose, has the majority of it in poetry, and then ends with prose. I'll talk about that a little bit. If you're not familiar with the book of Job, shame on you. Um, Job really is one of the most significant pieces of literature in human history. Um, it is an analysis, it, it starts out as the story of this man, Job, who is righteous and God, uh, God honoring and God honors Job. Job is very successful and well to do. He is given, uh, Satan appears before God and Satan asks for permission to tempt Job. Actually, God brags about Job and said, so Satan, what do you think of my servant Job and how righteous he is and how he honors me? And Satan says, well, of course he honors you. You gave him all this stuff. You know, he's rich. He's got a big family and herds and flocks and a big house. And Satan says, you take that away from him and he's not going to honor you. And so God says, all right, do so. And Job is afflicted with um, his children die because the house falls in on him. Uh, raiders come and take all of his animals, and, and everything's gone. 
And he still does not curse God. In fact, there's a, a wonderful passage where his wife says, why don't you just curse God and die? And he says, woman, you're speaking foolishly. Do we give thanks to God only for the good things and not for the bad? You know, the wisdom in that. How selfish we are to think that we can only, we can only respect God or honor Him if He gives us what we want. Okay. Well, Satan shows up in the presence of God again, and God goes, See, Satan, I told you, he did not curse me. He did not turn from me. He's still righteous. And Satan says, Yes, but everything a man has he'll give for his, his skin. You haven't, you haven't done anything against him you know, in terms of illness or anything yet. And God says, well, all right, you can smite his body, but you can't kill him. And then, on top of everything else, Job's body is inflicted with horrible boils and sores, even to the soles of his feet, it says. And the next scene, uh, he's sitting on an ash heap outside his house, scraping these boils with a, pot, with a, a broken piece of uh, pottery. And then three of his friends show up. Friends <laughs> show up. And they spend most of the book trying to convince him. There's three cycles where they try to convince Job that it must be his fault. That he has to have done something wrong or God wouldn't have done this. And Job continually insists, no, I have not done anything against God. I don't think it's just that he's done this to me. But he doesn't curse God. He questions, but he does not blame. Okay. And then at the very end, we have a fourth friend who is a young man because he says, I haven't spoken before. And he's not, he's not announced before that. The other three are. And he speaks out and says, I think you're all wrong. I think, Job, you're wrong in being so prideful as to think there's, there's, that you're so righteous that nothing should go wrong with you. And then you feel like God's responsible somehow in a negative way. And you three guys, you don't have a clue. <laughs> you know, you really are wrong about this. Uh, Ellie Hugh is his name. He's a good guy. And then God comes back on the scene, and God speaks to, to Job. And he basically says, were you there when I made the universe? Were you there when I stretched out the firmament, firmament above the heavens? Were you there when I determined the size of the Leviathan and the sea or the animals on the earth? Or any of the rest of this? Really? Were you there? Are you that smart and that wise and that good that you know all this stuff, Job? If so, tell me. And the book actually ends there with Job repenting from his pride, which was the only sin he really committed, the idea that he, he was righteous, because he really was. He actually is justified, and God, at the end, sort of demonstrates that by saying to the three friends, you know, not uh, Elihu, who spoke rightly, but to the three friends who kept saying, you, you must be a terrible person, Job, and won't admit it because God's done this to you. And he says, you know what? My judgment's coming out on you three unless Job prays for you and offers sacrifice on your behalf, and then I'll forgive you. And Job does. Okay. That's the story of Job. And it has been, as I said earlier, one of the most significant um, literary expressions of how do we understand suffering. To me, that first passage early in the book, when, when Job says to his wife, do we receive only good things from the hand of God and not bad? To me, that's the wisest of all. You know, that um, we want to pick and choose what the God of the whole universe can do and does in our lives. When in fact, you know, he's the righteous God. And that's what the sort of point is. So let me give you a little bit more. That's sort of my little mini sermon. <laughs> uh, can you tell I like this one? Uh, I like them all. But... Ross? Yes? Were, were these three friends really Christians? Well, nobody's a Christian. This is this. Well, I mean, did they really believe in God? Well, the suggestion is that they believed in God, but they just didn't have the right idea about how God dealt with his with his servant, with his people. You know, they thought God is a righteous God, and God. Now, you know, I'm glad you asked that because let me back up and give you a little bit of background. The the, the sermon that I preached on Sunday, uh, or not, it wasn't the sermon. It was actually in the gospel that I read was the passage where the rich man comes to Jesus and says, what do I have to do to be saved? And he says, you know, obey the commandments. And the, the rich man says, I've done all that since I you know, was a child. And Jesus looked at him and loved him. We forget that part. He looked at him and loved him and said, then go and sell all that you have and give your goods to the poor and then come and follow me. Because Jesus knew he was of great wealth and he couldn't do it. He walked away, you know, brokenhearted. And 
Jesus says, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. The interesting part about that that we don't catch is that the disciples are just like, what? <laughs> then how can anybody be saved? The thing you need to understand about that is the Jewish conception, or idea in other words, from Job all the way to the New Testament, Jesus' time, is that if a person was rich and well-to-do, that was the sign of God's blessing. That if God loved you especially and blessed you and you were a good person in God's sight, then He gave you lots of cool stuff. He made you rich. And if you were not a righteous person, then God afflicted you. That's why lepers were considered not just unclean in terms of spiritually unclean, because it was thought they were being judged by God. For, God to, for somebody to have that horrible disease, or even to be poor or whatever, was a sign that God didn't love them. When, when the, the, man, the man born blind, they asked the question, was it this man who sinned or his parents? Because for somebody to be born blind, somebody had to have screwed up for God to have done that to them. They had this concept that the material, or physical even, status that you had in, in this life was a direct reflection of what God thought of you. And so these three guys who come, these three friends of Job's who come and say, God has done all this stuff to you. You must be a horrible person. Admit it. Was completely consistent with the Jewish conception. Now, there's not even, it's not even clear that these guys were Jewish because this is the most, again, one of the very oldest books. It's believed that this happened, this event probably happened sometime between uh, Noah and Moses. Okay? In fact... Uh, it, it talks about the land of Uz. This is the ancient land of Uz. Now, to give you an idea, this is uh, Israel. This is the Dead Sea. This is the Sea of Galilee, the Sinai Peninsula, Egypt. So Uz would have been down here in the northern part of modern Arabia. <coughs> Not a very pleasant place to be. I mean, it's desert kind of stuff. But that was the ancient land of Uz. Um, and... As I said before, we believe that Job is either the oldest or probably the, perhaps the second oldest book written um, equal to or around the same time as Genesis. So it's a very, very old story. And it doesn't even make it clear that these, the, the people that were involved in this in terms of his friends or whatnot, that they were Jewish necessarily. They could have been something else. Okay. Um, but they had a concept of God. But you need to remember that that from the time of prior to Noah and then after Noah, there were a lot of people other than just the Jews that had some conception of there being a you know, God. And so they could have been speaking not in terms of the Yahweh God that, that Moses you know, was, was clarified for the Jews. They may have had some other concept of God, but they still had the idea that if, if horrible things have happened to you, it must be because you did something to offend God, you know, that God doesn't like you anymore. Okay? So, let me go back up here. Uh, the, the book of Job breaks down into sort of five sections. Um, there are, are cycles of talk in here. The chapters 1 and 2 are the sort of historic prologue where Job is tested. He's introduced and then Satan appears to God and, and God brags about Job and Satan says, well, let me test him. Then you get chapters 3 to 31, which are the... Um, the Discourses with Job's friends. And those actually run in three cycles. Um, the, from Job 3 introduces it, and then you get Eliphaz, one of his friends, speaks, and then Job responds. And then you get Bildad, a friend, speaks, and then Job responds. And then you get Zophar speaking. Then you get into the second cycle. The, then the comments are the same. That's why we see these in cycles. They, say, or basically, they basically say the same thing, and they come back and make the same argument. Job responds at the start of cycle 2, which is chapter 12 to 14, and then Eliphaz speaks, and then Job speaks, and then Bildad speaks, and then Job speaks, and then Zophar speaks. The same list. Then a third cycle. Job speaks first in chapter 21, and then Eliphaz, and then Job, and then Bildad, and then Job. And then we get to, in chapter 33, Elihu speaks, this young man who says, you know, I've been quiet all this time because you guys are older than me and I'm trying to be respectful. But you guys are jerks. Okay, that's my translation of the Hebrew. Um, you guys are completely wrong about this. Joe, you're wrong, and you three are really wrong. And so Elihu gives his uh, 
acknowledgement that Joe, for all of his righteousness, is being prideful and thinking that he can't have any negative responsibility. And yet, human beings being what they are, we all have our problems. And God is righteous, and God knows what he's doing, and you don't seem to be recognizing that, Joe. And then he turns to his three friends and says, you guys really don't have a clue, you know, that, that thinking that Joe has to have been an evil person in order for this to happen. Then, chapter 38 to 41, we get the beautiful declarations by God about him being the maker of the whole universe and the one true God. And who are you, Joe? Remind me how powerful and wise you are that you can question me about this stuff. And when you read it, it doesn't sound nearly as presumptuous as the way I'm saying it. You get the sense that, oh, yeah, you know what? God has a right to say that and to do what he will because he is God and we are not. And then you get the epilogue where Job is restored. At the final thing, he has more children, his herds are restored, his home is back, his wealth is restored, all of that. And he has prayed for and offered sacrifice for his three friends so they don't get nuked by God. Right? The interesting thing, too, is that it starts out, Job 1 and 2, the first two chapters, um, which is the, the prologue where Job is introduced, uh, God, the devil, and Job's first tempting. That is all in prose. It's written out in, in a, like an area. Then you get to chapter 3, which is where the, the, the dialogues start. You know, the, up here, the dialogue and discourse, which you can see here. And that, from uh, chapter 3 to the middle of chapter 42, the sixth verse of chapter 42, is in poetry. It's a poetic form. Then... From the last part of chapter 42, which is the epilogue uh, from verse 7 to 14, is back into prose again. So it sort of opens and closes in very matter-of-fact kind of narrative. And then in between, all of the discussion about Job's suffering and what caused it and everything else is in the form of poetry. Um, Hebrew poetry. Um, let me say what the story is. It starts with the heavenly challenge, where Satan says, well, sure, he likes you, because you've done all the good stuff for him. We then have Job's calamities are represented. We get Job, Satan's second accusation, where he says, um, you know, skin for skin, all a man has, he will give for his life. That's a, an Old Testament, you know, uh, or an old King James kind of reference. Uh, I actually used to be the director of public relations for an outdoor theater, and that was a line that they used in this play during the Civil War about, you know, People will do anything to save them themselves. Um, that's the second accusation. And then Job's continuing endurance. He never blames God. He challenges God to explain, you know, I haven't done anything wrong. Why have you done this to me? He never says, you're an evil God or anything like that. And that's the key part. And then, of course, we have the, the Job's three friends. The main cast of characters, Job, Mrs. Job. <laughs> um, that's all we have for her, Mrs. Job. God, Satan, of course, and then the three friends, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar, and then the fourth friend, the young one, Elihu, who really is the only one through this whole thing who seems to have it right uh, until God comes to straighten them all out. It's a critical part of it through the whole thing is the way in which Job maintains his innocence. He says, for instance, I made a covenant with my eyes that I would not look on a woman to lust. He goes through this litany, through this, these, these discourses, of saying all of these things that people, men, are prone to do that are evil and against God, I have not done. So why am I getting picked on again? He says, I gave food and clothing to the poor and the widow and the orphan. I did not let my own prosperity get in the way of my relationship with God, and on and on. Okay. Now this is what Elihu actually uh, is presented. Then these three men ceased answering Job because he was righteous in his own eyes. The three men were the, the, the friends that who um, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar, who said, Job, you have to be a bad guy, or this would have happened. But the anger of Elihu, the son of Bereshel, the Buzzite, of the family of Ram, burned. He's mad at these guys. Against Job, his anger burned, because he justified himself before God. And his anger burned against his three friends because they found no answer, and yet had condemned Job. Now, Elihu had waited to speak to Job because they were years older than him. And he goes on to say, um, you know, you guys simply don't get it right. And when God finally speaks, he first says, I don't have to answer you, Job. Remember, I am God. 
And he does not give Job any particular comfort in the situation. He doesn't pat him on the head and go, oh, well, I'm sorry, you had to go through this. Um, but what he does say is this. Job, part of it is this, because it's actually like five chapters or, that he speaks. Then the Lord answered Job out of the storm. He said, who is this that darkens my counsel with words without knowledge? Brace yourself like a man. I will question you and you will answer me. Where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Tell me if you understand. Who marked off its dimensions? Surely you know. Who stretched a measuring line across it? On what were its footings set? And who laid its cornerstone? While the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy. Who shut up the sea behind doors when it burst forth from the, from the womb? When I made the clouds its garment and wrapped it in thick darkness. When I fixed limits for it and set its doors and bars in place. When I said, this far you may come and no farther. Here is where your proud waves halt. And he goes on to basically say, think for a minute what, what it means that I'm God and you're not before you challenge me on this stuff, Job. So the lessons from Job, I believe, are, first, that God is both all-loving and all-powerful. You know, God is not, not without compassion here. He has some concerns. And it, an interesting thing, too, is that with all the suffering in the world and people will say, well, you know, God doesn't care, Job is an example of the fact that God is actively limiting suffering. There's a limit to what Satan is allowed to do, and there is a reason for it, which proves to be a useful one in terms of Job's testimony, and in terms of what this book has meant to people for the last, you know, almost 2,000 years, well, 3,400 years. Um, so God is all-powerful, He is also all-loving. Second, there aren't any simple answers. One of the things about the book of Job that I think is very powerful is that it doesn't, it doesn't try to give an easy answer. Ultimately, it says, are we going to take only good things and not bad things from God? And he is God and we are not. And there's a certain point in which we don't really know. We are not wise enough. We do not see far enough. We are not clear enough in our understanding to be able to question God on this stuff. It doesn't make it easy. And the book doesn't try to make it easy. That's why there's no simple answers. Uh, it also is, it gives us a sense that the expression of grief and trouble is appropriate which is what Job does. He's very clear on the grief he's experiencing and the, the trouble, and, and he asks questions. Why is this? What is going on, God? I have been righteous. You know, show me what it is I've done wrong if there's something wrong. But he does not judge God. He does not condemn God. He doesn't say, well, if you're going to be like this God, then I'm not going to worship you anymore. That never happens. God does not mind when we ask hard questions. God does not mind when we express our grief as long as we don't do it in a condemnation of God, he's okay with that. All right? God does not condemn Job. He does clarify things for him, very, very much so. But he doesn't say, okay, now you've done it. Because, because Job just asks questions. God is never afraid of our questions. Again, God is in control, uh, even when it's not obvious to us. Just because we can't see through to the end doesn't mean that God isn't in control. God has a purpose in what he allows, even if we don't know what it is. And tragedy can actually serve as a wake-up call. It certainly was a wake-up call for Job's friends, and I think for Elihu, for all, for all four of them. Uh, to some extent, I believe it was a wake-up call for Job. He realized that maybe he had been a little presumptuous about what he expected from God. And God straightened him out on that. God, God ended up blessing him more than ever before, but he needed to realize Tragedy affects us like that. Uh, C.S. Lewis once said that, that pain is the megaphone that God uses to get our attention sometimes. Mm -hmm. And also that God has not remained distant from us in our pain. You know, God limited the suffering that Job could experience. God heard all that Job had to say and all his friends had to say, and God responded. He did not remain distant, even though he was the God of the whole universe. Any questions about that or about Job? Bob? I really like the passage where Job quoted Jimmy Carter about not lusting after women. Actually, that's not what Jimmy Carter said. 
He said he liked the passage where Job quoted Jimmy Carter about lusting after women. The thing that got Jimmy Carter in, in trouble is he told the truth and said, well, yeah, there are times when I've seen beautiful women and I, you know, felt something. So, go ahead. But a couple of questions. Uh, the first one is, how did the writer of Job know that the Lord would be So the two questions are, how did the writer know what the conversation was between the devil and God? And are there other characters similar to this in other literature? The first one is, we don't know. first answer is, we don't know any, any more than we know anything about how the, the writers of Scripture, Old Testament or New Testament, could speak for God in terms of that. That we believe that there was a divine inspiration. How that was communicated? I don't really know, but we believe that the, the, the content of it is, is accurate. I mean, that's our faith in Scripture. And so, however, the inspiration of that by the Holy Spirit to the writer of this came, that's how they got it. I mean, that same challenge could be put to a lot of stuff in Scripture in terms of, was that person really present for all of that? No, but the Spirit gives them knowledge of it. That's... That's our belief. And the fact that it plays out as being true and reliable and worthwhile in the long run is, is what we base our faith in that on. Um, your second question about are there other Job-like characters, not, I'm not aware of any that are exactly like that. I can't claim to know all the other ancient literature that's available. But it is true that Job um, qualifies as what's called wisdom literature. You sometimes hear that expression, they'll talk about the wisdom literature part of the books. Wisdom literature was larger than just the Tanakh, larger than just the Hebrew Bible. There was other ancient Near Eastern writings which had to do with living a righteous life, you know, a good life, whatever, that were not, were not part of the Bible, not Hebrew writings. Um, there were some ancient Egyptian writings that are considered part of the tradition of wisdom literature. There were some Hittite writings, other ancient Near Eastern kinds of stuff. And all of it had to do with understanding human life and living it better. The difference here is the direct reference back to reality and presence of the one God. Um, but the idea behind it of coming to some understanding of the struggle with suffering and human existence and the meaning of it and all that, there was tradition of a wisdom literature in other cultures as well. Was Job fictitious or was he was he a historical figure? Other references through scripture suggest that, that other people believe that he was a historical figure. We don't have but any proof of written that. written by an unknown author. Correct. This was not written by Job. No, we don't know who the author was. Um, the, again, mm -hmm. like other parts of Scripture, whether Job was a historical character or not really isn't the major point. You know, he may have been, he may not have been. The point is the truth that is expressed there is true and was given to us for a reason. Again, that's why I think people, even not religious people, have read the book of Job and it has been meaningful to them in terms of understanding who they are in light of the suffering and realities of the world. Uh, well, it doesn't, the it, doesn't, is true. it doesn't add or take away whether he was real or not, but I was just asking, you know, if he was a, if he was a historical figure. Yeah, there are a couple of other places in scripture I think that they refer to, to Job as though he really were a person, but that's all we've got in terms, in terms of that. Uh, yes, Ross. It's always puzzled me at the end when Job gets everything back again. It seems that the message is, if you stay faithful, God will restore everything that's been taken away. But that's just not true. No. And, and that's what I always found as wisdom literature. It seemed to have a very poor ending. <laughs> I was always puzzled by not that wise then. If you, if you hang on and you're faithful and you trust in God, well, He'll give you this all back again. No, yeah. He won't. Well, and that's so that. That's one way we could read that. I mean, is that He'll always give it all back to you? Or I think the right way to read it is to say, in this case, He did. In other words, He might. It is. It is within God's. It is within God's capability to do that. As a, as a Simply as a gift, as a gift out of his graciousness to give us back what we've lost, uh, but he doesn't always do it. You're right, and there's no promise here. I mean, there's not nowhere in here does it say, and because Job was faithful, God did what He always does, and that is He gave him all the stuff back. No, and, and yet 
it's also true that there are times when it does happen. I mean, I've shared um, in the church. Carolyn and I had the experience after we made a decision to make what for us was a pretty substantial financial commitment to, to a, a Christian cause. Um, we did so knowing that we weren't going to be able to take a, a vacation like the last one we took on the, you know, the Turkey and Greece, and we just said, we're not going to be able to do that anymore if we do this. And we felt like I was calling us to do it. We did it. Two weeks later, I was invited to be the speaker on a cruise that's probably going to be much nicer than the last one, okay, and, and twice as long. And, and that's not because we're cool. That's because God's cool, okay? Um, and it's not, to me, that's, you know, that's like the Job story. I'm not going to stand up here and tell you that, okay, if you yeah. if you make what for you is a very substantial gift, then God will give you really cool stuff. Now, there's some preachers who say that. That's the prosperity gospel. That is not scripture, okay? The fact that God sometimes does that in His will and in His understanding, we can't negate, and we can't negate that either. Sometimes God does bless, and there, some of you would have similar stories, okay? Um, the story of Job is one where He did. There are other stories where He didn't. And that true is in his wisdom and goodness. And we accept that. Okay? So he can. And with Joby did, doesn't mean he promises he always will. Because there may be a deeper, wiser issue than you getting the stuff back. Alright? It always seemed to me when I was a kid, thanks to me, I used to think, well, I don't think it was very fair of me to take it all away from him like that. And anyway, if it's all been taken away from me like that, he can't give him his original children back nope. again. Yeah. Okay. I mean, that seems a little bit harsh. <laughs> <laughs> Go back and read what God says. <laughs> All right. I want to introduce for you, we're not going to get too far in this, but I want to introduce the Hamesh Migelo to you. Um, these are the five scrolls. They are the Song of Psalms, or Song of Solomon, as you might know them, the Book of Ruth, the Book of Lamentations the book of Ecclesiastes, and the book of Esther. And you will notice, by the way, this is not Ecclesiasticus. If you ever see Ecclesiasticus, that's from the Apocrypha. That's not part of the Protestant Bible. That's, that's the, Catholic has that, the Catholic Church has that as part of the Apocrypha. Ecclesiastes and Ecclesiasticus are two different things. Actually, Carolyn and I were watching a TV show the other night, and there was a, a supposedly a letter from this radical Christian group. I hate it when they have radical Christian groups. <laughs> and across the top, they had a, a scripture verse, and it was from Isaiah's S, okay, which is an apocryphal name. That's not the book of Isaiah, and it actually played into the plot that somebody noticed the fact that that's not the usual name from a because it was supposed to have been a Protestant group. That's not the Protestant name. That's a Catholic version. So anyway, it's Ecclesiastes. These five scrolls, as they're called, um, the Song of Songs is about love, but it's about marital love. It's about sexual love. It's often been interpreted as a metaphor for the relationship between God and the nation of Israel, or his people Israel. The question that it asks is, how shall I love? What does it mean to love? The book of Ruth, great, great story, is a book about loyalty, fidelity, and redemption. And the real question it answers is, will faithfulness bring redemption? Ruth was a Moabite woman. She was not a Jewess. She was not Jewish. And yet when her father-in-law died, her brother-in-law died, and her husband had died, she chose to stay with her Jewish mother-in-law, Naomi, when Naomi went back to Israel after being, you know, being gone from Israel because of a famine for me. We then have the book of Lamentations. Lamentations is a book about God's judgment in the destruction of Jerusalem. It's traditionally written by, and we believe it's written by, the prophet Jeremiah, when the Babylonians destroyed Jerusalem, destroyed uh, the temple. And the question that it answers is, can we still have faith after great, such great suffering? If all of this, everything that we were putting our faith in, in terms of God's expression of his will for the, for the Jewish people, if all of that's been destroyed, then on what do we put our faith? <coughs> then you have the book of Ecclesiastes, which is a book about the problem of the meaning in life. The person, <coughs> who is traditionally Solomon, who has everything and can do anything, and yet he finds it all meaningless. And if you're a fan of the all rock and roll, roll uh, group, The Birds, to everything there's a, uh, to everything there's a season, turn, turn, turn. Um, that's directly, the, the lyrics for that song are directly out of the book of Ecclesiastes. We'll get to that. 
And then you have the book of Esther. Again, a wonderful book about God's protection of the Jews. And the question is, will God ever abandon his people, even in, in, uh, when they are away from his promised land? One of the things, the reason that these five are gathered together as five scrolls is because early on in Jewish tradition, they decided that these have particular stories which need to be retold over and over and over again at certain times of the year. In particular, um, each of these five scrolls is read at a, at a different time in the Jewish calendar as part of the Jewish celebrations. I mentioned to you earlier that, that we had, uh, you know, there's some other writings that get read at uh, particular festivals and things. These five are always read at these times during the Jewish calendar. The Song of Solomon, which again is about, it's, it's about marital love, it's about sexual love, but it's seen as a very strong metaphor for the relationship between God and his people Israel. And that same kind of metaphor is played out, for instance, in the, in the book of Hosea, the prophet Hosea, where Hosea is told to marry a prostitute as a symbol of the fact that, that the, God's people, who, or his bride, have been unfaithful to him. They have prostituted themselves. So Hosea has that message. Well, the same idea is reflected in the Jewish understanding of the book of Song of Solomon. And so that whole scroll, which uh, the, is a Megillah, Megillah is uh, the... Hamish Megillot means five scrolls. The whole scroll of the Song of Solomon is read at Passover because it's seen as symbolizing the relationship between God and his people. And remember, Passover was the start of the celebration of the great exodus where God proved his love for his people by taking them out of slavery in Egypt. And so the, the, the Megillah of the Song of Solomon is read at Passover. The book of Ruth, which is a book about fidelity and faithfulness, um, is read every year at the Savuot. Savuot is the anniversary of the day that God gave the Torah, the law, to, to the uh, Hebrew people through Moses. And so every year they celebrate that. And the dates along the bottom are very approximate. You'll see the note here. Uh, approximate dates because the, the Hebrew calendar is a, the Jewish calendar is a lunar calendar. And so the dates vary from year to year. You can't say exactly, but this is sort of a central approximate of that. That's why Easter falls on a different day every uh, uh, every year. It's not like it's the the fourth Thursday or it's the you know the the nineteenth of April every year. It varies because it's based upon the phases of the moon, which is what the Hebrew calendar is based on. And our Easter is the Jewish Passover. Okay, same thing, same dates. So um, Ruth is read on the, the uh, Shavuot, which is the celebration of the giving of the Torah, which is the same day we have as Pentecost. Pentecost means 50 days. It occurs 50 days after the Passover. So Passover celebration of the Exodus, 50 days later the celebration of the giving of the Torah. And think about, think about the background story. Moses leads, you know, they have the Passover where, the, where death passes over the Hebrew homes and takes the firstborn of all the Egyptians. Pharaoh finally says you can go, they leave, they cross the Red Sea, they cross the desert, they get to Mount Sinai, and God gives the law, Torah, to Moses for the Hebrew people, 50 days later. That's why Passover was the Exodus, 50 days later at Mount Sinai, the giving of the law is Pentecost. We take those same dates as our Easter and Pentecost celebration, which was the first, the start of the Christian church when the Holy Spirit came upon the disciples in Jerusalem. But those are originally Jewish holidays to celebrate the Exodus and the giving of the law. Okay? So, Ruth is read in the Shabbat, which is the Pentecost, or the, the 50 days and the giving of the Torah. Then you have Lamentations about the fall of Jerusalem. Um, and this is read every year at the, at the Tisha B'Av. It's called Tisha B'Av. is the day that they recognize, I don't want to say celebrate, but they acknowledge the destruction of of both the first temple and the second temple. The first temple was destroyed in 586 by the Babylonians. The second temple was destroyed in 70 AD by the Romans. And so the Jewish holiday of Tisha B'Av is the day in which they acknowledge in great grief the, the destruction of the temple. Well, the Book of Lamentations is about the 586 destruction of, of the first temple. And so they read that uh, scroll in celebration, not celebration, in recognition of the significance of that day, right? Then you have Ecclesiastes, 
Ecclesiastes, the fourth of the book of scrolls, or the fourth scroll of the books, is read on Sukkot, which is the Feast of Booths, or the Feast of Tabernacles, which originally was a, um, a celebration of the, the plentifulness of harvest, um, and it especially initially was, was designed, if you know anything about the reason it's called the, Booth, the Festival of Tabernacles, is they build these little sort of temporary structures. Well, those structures are intended to represent the time that the Israelites spent wandering around in the desert for 40 years, okay, before they actually were given the promised land, which was the land flowing with milk and honey and where, where they would be able to have crops. So it's an acknowledgement of the wandering in the desert and ultimately is a recognition of the fact that God brought them to a place where there was fertility and uh, where they would grow crops, the, the festival of Sukkot. And then the fourth one, which is, in terms of celebration, is the most fun, is the, the, the uh, scroll of Esther, the story of Esther. Esther is read every year at the festival of Purim. Purim is the uh, celebration of the book of Esther story, where the Jews were threatened by complete destruction by um, the Assyrian king. Uh, the story of Esther, if you don't know it, you really should. It's a great story. Uh, and the reason I say it's, it's wonderful in terms of the celebration is because every year when they read this, people dress up in costumes, and they have noisemakers, and whenever they mention the name of the bad guy, Haman, they have these clackers, and when, whenever the people are reading it and they come to the name Haman, they go, <laughs> so you can't actually hear Haman's name. Uh, and so there's this huge celebration because the story is that Esther is a queen who is... Um, ends up being married to the Persian king, uh, Artaxerxes, and she's, she's living in the palace in Susa. This is why I confused this with Jonah that time, because Esther takes place in Susa, Jonah takes place in Nineveh. Nineveh. Um, and in the palace, while she's there, her cousin, who has raised her, taking care of her, Mordecai, he is sort of a palace uh, consultant. You know, he's, he's a guy who's part of court. And he refuses to recognize Haman, who is, Haman is the bad guy of the story, because Haman is a, an Amalekite, and the Amalekites had been historic enemies of the Jews. They had, they, when the Jewish people were coming into the Holy Land, the Amalekites would sneak up and kill the people in the back. I mean, they were really being sneaky about it, and they were cursed by God. And so Mordecai refuses to give honor to the senior court official, Haman, because he's an Amalekite, and he represents the people who are against God. Um, well, Haman wants to get Mordecai, so Haman gets the king to sign an edict that all of the Jews are going to be destroyed on a given day. You know, in the future. They set the date in which the Jews are all going to be killed and all the property is going to be taken. And they announce it all over the Persian Empire. Well, Mordecai goes to Esther, uh, by the way, the king, Artaxerxes, does not know that Esther is Jewish. Mordecai goes to Esther and say, your people are about to be destroyed, and you need to go tell the king. And she says, well, you know what? The rules are that you can't go into the king's presence unless he calls for you. If you just show up, the penalty is death, unless he specially decides that he's going to let you get away with it this time by pointing a scepter at you. And so Esther comes and says, I'm not going to do that. And Mordecai says, you know what? If you don't do it, God will raise up somebody else. God will not let his people be destroyed. But it may be that you have been brought to this position for just such a time as this. A wonderful, wonderful verse. It may be that it is, you've been put in this position for just such a time as this. Esther agrees. She goes into the king. The king welcomes her. She says, I want to have a party, a banquet for you and Haman tomorrow night in my quarters. Show up. So the king and Haman show up. They have this nice banquet. The king says, what is it you want? And she said, I want you to come back to another banquet tomorrow night. <laughs> I don't know if it's because she really couldn't bring herself to say it, or she was building up or whatever. So they leave, they come back, and Haman this whole time is feeling like, Queen has invited me to two banquets, just her and me and the king, and I am special. And he is getting ready to do Mordecai in, so he has a gallows built outside his home where he's going to have, have, have Mordecai hung. Well, they come in the second night. To the banquet, and after a while, Esther screws her courage to the sticking places, as um, Shakespeare said, and tells the king that her people, including her, are about to be destroyed; that they're going to all be killed on a certain day. And Artaxerxes says, "What evil person is responsible for this?" And she goes, "Him." 
<laughs> Amen. It's his rule. Well, the king is so furious, he walks out of the room, it's like he's fuming. While he's out of the room, Haman, who's panicked, goes over and starts trying to plead with Esther, and the king walks back in right that moment, and it looks like he's attacking her. So the king says, all right, no, no, you know, he says, you, stop. And he calls his guards in and says, what are we going to do with this awful guy? And they go, well, right outside Haman's house, there's a gallows. <laughs> We can hang him there. They, good idea. So they hang Haman, destroy his house. Um, there's a, there's another wonderful little scene. I, I, I love this story. I hope you don't mind. Uh, there's a scene where um, before the banquet thing happens, um, the king, at one point, two of his officials had been plotting to assassinate him. Mordecai, who was sort of a court official, had found out about this and let the king know they captured these two guys before they could do anything, and they were executed. And so the king had forgotten about this. He's sitting in his, you know, in, in his throne one day, and he's having one of his scribes read him the stories, the annals. The kings love that. Tell me, read me all the wonderful things I've done. And they're reading all these things, and they get to the part about these two guys plotting against him, and that they were foiled by Mordecai. And Artaxerxes says, did I do anything to reward Mordecai for that? And they went, no. He said, well, I should. Right that minute, Haman comes in. And the king says, Haman, tell me something. How do you think I should honor a man that has pleased the king and served him well? And Haman says, well, because he thinks it's him. He says, I think you should put a robe on this man, a robe that you yourself have worn. You should put him on your horse that has your insignia. And you should have another senior court official lead this man on your horse wearing your robe around the city calling out, this is what the king does to a man who pleases it. And Artaxerxes says, that's a great idea. I want you to go right now and do that for Mordecai. <laughs> and, and Haman hated Mordecai. So that was the first kind of comeuppance. But then later... Haman is hanged. The problem is that in the law of the Medes and the Persians, because this is the Persian Empire, it was not possible for the, even the king to revoke an official decree. He couldn't just say, okay, change my mind. So instead, what Mordecai comes up with, and the king agrees to, is he gives the Jews permission to defend themselves. And they know what day it's coming. So the Jews get ready for it. They arm themselves. They prepare themselves. And when that day comes... They end up fighting back and winning. In fact, the massacre against these people that were on Haman's side lasts for two days. And the Jews survive. Okay. Well, that's the story of Purim. That's the story of the book of Esther. It's a wonderful story. Go and read it. In fact, you're supposed to read it for this week. Yeah, well, <laughs> <laughs> but you did. You did. did I tell it right? <laughs> It's a wonderful story, and it's, it's one in which um, God, well, I should say this too. Two of the books that almost did not make it into our Bible were Revelation, because let's face it, Revelation is really hard to understand, and the book of Esther, actually three, the book of Esther, and the Song of Songs, because the Song of Songs is about sexual love. I mean, that, that's, and, and the Jews have always seen that as metaphorical, but that's what it's about. Uh, in fact, the Jews would not allow their children to read the Song of Songs. Okay. Um, but the other book, the third book that almost didn't make it into Scripture, was the book of Esther. And why? Does anybody, you know why, so don't you say it, because you said it earlier. You know why the book of Esther didn't, almost didn't make it into this canon? Mary? Um, doesn't mention anything about God. God is never mentioned in the book of Esther. There is the assumption that God is working behind the scenes, but God nowhere is mentioned in the book of Esther. In fact... That's one of the things about the Apocrypha, is the Apocrypha comes back and has an addendum to Esther in order to get the name of God in there. Okay. Are you serious? Sort of an add-on, yeah. <laughs> but the book of Esther, as we have it in the, in the Tanakh, does not have uh, God mentioned in it anywhere. Okay? I've run out of time. We will pick up with this stuff next week. As I told you, I, I had kind of a week there. I wasn't exactly sure what I was going to do. Any questions? One more. For, forgive me for my you know, going on and on and on about this stuff. For uh, homework next time, what I would like for you all to do is to read the book of Ecclesiastes. Oh, no, you read that this week. This week. I, I wanted you to read Esther, Ecclesiastes, and I have it in here. Uh, I want you to read the book of Daniel.
because we're going to focus quite a bit of time next week on Daniel. So the book of Daniel, it's not a short book, but that's all you have to do next week. Alright? Is there any other culture that celebrates their history and their past as Okay, are you guys listening? There's a question. The question was, is there any other culture that celebrates their history and past the way the Jews do? I don't know that there's any that have maintained certainly as long and as fervent a tradition of celebrating, you know, um, as the Jews. So I think my answer would be no. If there is, I'm not aware of it. I mean, certainly there are people who celebrate traditions, but the Jews have been doing it for 3,500 years. Thanks. Or what? Is there a tomb of Actually, there's a claim of the tomb of Esther in, um, in Iran. Because again, she was in.